So one thing I'll just share about that experience is that when I was elected to the CalPERS board, I was the first woman to be elected in 40 years. Whoa. Whoa. Zero, zero. And wow. I didn't really realize I was I was doing something so significant by just by being elected to this board. But I'm very proud of that because you know CalPERS represents a majority of women uh, wow. workers. And most of our, most, you know, more than 50% of our members are women. And it's, it's we, you know, the board should represent who, um, who, we, rep who we represent as, uh, as, an, as an entity. And so I'm proud of that. I'm, at the time, I was the only woman out of 13, so there were 12 guys on the board. And uh, I'll tell you, it was quite an adjustment. <laughs> But um, over the years, I think I gained the confidence of my fellow board members who've also had been able to attract more women to the board. And if I could, just uh, I'll ask her to stand up now. We have one of my fellow board members, Teresa Taylor, in the audience. Hi, Teresa. Teresa represents the Office of Women. She's the great treasurer of um, SEIU Local 1000, and she's running for the board this year, for re-election to the board this year. Uh, she's a great ally of mine, and uh, um, I really respect her views and opinions. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll cut, it sh I'll cut it short, but but it has made a difference, I think, to have more women, more diversity on the board that really better reflects um, better reflects the membership of CalPERS. And one last thing, I'll just share this one story. So early in my tenure on the board, I wanted to serve as the chair of a committee. And the then president said to me, you know, Priya, you are just too ambitious. <laughs> how, how dare you ask for a, for a leadership position on this board? Well, I can tell you, I'm still here 15 years later, and today I am president of the CalPERS board. <laughs> <laughs> want to serve, who have the gumption, the talent, the, the smarts, the integrity, the ethics, the, the values to serve in public office, I tell you, you can do it. And, all, and it, takes, it takes hard work for sure. It takes perseverance, but any one of you can be a leader. Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, just diving into some, uh, some questions that I've heard from people and that I think uh, would be interesting for us to talk about. And again, we only have 30 minutes. Uh, so, um, I can't ask all of the questions that I would love to, to talk to you about. It would take three hours or more. Um, but one thing that we've heard a lot about and, uh, um, is pension squeezing local employers. Uh, we hear that at the bargaining table up and down the state. Um, and could you talk a little bit about um, what, what, what your interpretation of that question and what's really going on there? Well, I'll tell you, I think just flat out it's a bit of a red herring. So it, there's no question that um, pensions, pension contributions by employers have gone up recently and are projected to continue to go up to some degree. But as a percentage of budget, they haven't gone up very substantially. And there are other things, you know, CalPERS suffered in the, the, depth, the two economic downturns in 2002 and 2008, as, as many others did. Local governments also suffered as a result of those two economic downturns. Uh, we've seen local governments' revenues decline. They're, they're now making their way back, but they, they suffered a decline in tax revenues. They saw a decline in state uh, rev revenues from the state, the close of redevelopment agencies. We're all, we all know the story. Um, but also, a lot of employers have made decisions that have further constrained their revenues. And I'll give you an example. In the city of Anaheim, they recently made a decision to uh, waive Disney's uh, entertainment taxes for 30 years. Yeah. They made that decision to constrain their revenues. And then they turn around and say, CalPERS, you are squeezing us. <laughs> I mean, does that make any sense? <laughs> it really doesn't. Now, we are doing our best at CalPERS to try to achieve full funding. That is a top, our top priority, is to get our fund back to a full funding status. Today, we're about 70% funded. It's not a very comfortable place to be. It's better than we were, <laughs> but it's not where we want to be. And so, you know, we do a lot of work to analyze where we think investment markets are going to go over the ten, next 10 years, over the next 30 years. What we think are going to happen around demographics. Are people going to live longer in retirement? We hope so, and it also puts pain on the system at the same time. But 
you know, we look at all of these things, and based on those, we make certain decisions. And so two recent decisions that we made was to reduce our target rate of investment return from 7.5% to 7%, because we think over the next 30 years, it's going to be really challenging to get to 7.5%. And so we have to be honest about that. It's, it's important for us as fiduciaries of your money um, that we protect that. And, so, and the other thing that we did is we changed the amortization schedule, which is a fancy word of saying how we spread investment returns and demographic um, factors over time. We used to spread them over 30 years, now we're going to spread them over 20 years. And that both of those things are causing contributions to go up. But I just want you all to know that when we make these decisions, we don't make them in a vacuum. We don't just look blindly at what we need um, in order to fully fund the system. We think about what it means at the bargaining table, what it means for workers in terms of, um, you know, jobs. Are, are jobs going to be um, uh, reduced as a result of the actions that we take? And also in terms of what it means for you all in terms of salaries at the bargaining table. We think about these things and the capacity of the employers to fund them. And we try to make a strike a balance that achieves our, our necessary sort of funding sustainability with um, also not putting too much pressure on public agencies. And so you mentioned uh, the 70% funding um, in addition to the change in amortization period. What, what's the, can you talk a little bit more about the process that you go through on that? Because, you know, people hear about the stock market having record returns and, and when we hear, and a lot of people in this room hear that, um, you know, investment targets uh, are being reduced and, and we're, people don't really understand that. Could you talk sure. a little bit more about that? Yeah, it is tricky. And one of the things, when, people, when the markets are high, it's easy to believe that the markets are going to continue to be high for a long time to come. But usually when, the mark, when companies are valued really high, that means that they're there's probably going to be a correction and things are going to go the other way. And what we do, our process around what we call our asset allocation process, is where we think about what the markets are going to do over the next 10 years and the next 30 years. And we make our decisions around our discount rate and around um, uh, how, where we're going to put the money in terms of different types of investments, so stocks, bonds, etc. That, that's called our asset allocation decision. And we involve several consultants who share with us their projections of where they think the markets are going to go, with different asset classes are going to go, both in, asset classes are what I just talked about, stocks, bonds, etc. Um, in terms of both the returns that we can expect over the next period, the next 10 years, the next 30 years, but also the risk of, of significant dip changes in the value of those, um, of those investments. So we don't want to just go for all of the riskiest investments that, you know, where we could hit the ball out of the park and, and get huge returns, but also on the flip side, if things go wrong, they could go down really significantly. So we, we try to sort of balance what the risk level of the fund is as well. So we have a multi-month, a very, very long process where we talk to our consultants, we talk to our own investment team internally, uh, we consider the various factors, and then we ultimately come to a decision. Great. Uh, and and, and uh, moving on from asset allocation, one thing that uh, gets a lot of press and a lot of people are talking about is divestment. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that be in coal, whether it be in firearms, uh, with, with the, the movement that's going on across the country. Could you talk a little bit about the process that the board goes through uh, when considering its asset allocation and making changes uh, that may have social consequences or, or to make a social statement? Um, could you talk a little bit about that <coughs> process? Yeah, sure. So, a couple of things. First, um, back in 2013, the CalPERS board adopted what we call our investment beliefs. These are a set of 10 guiding principles that provide the framework for how we think about investments. And included in those investment beliefs are two that I think are particularly material to this, um, to this question. One is that we can consider wider stakeholder views when making decisions as long as they're not contradictory to our fiduciary duty. And the second is that as long-term owners of companies, that we must consider what the, what the uh, three different factors, human capital, financial capital, and physical capital. And those are basically three code words for um, uh, human capital is workers <laughs> uh, and people, uh, human rights, labor rights, all of that is embedded in the, in the human capital component. And the physical capital is, includes the environment, climate change, water risk, uh, et cetera. 
And we see these at CalPERS as long-term systemic risks that, yes, will impact our planet, impact people's lives on the ground, but also will have meaning, material impacts on our own, the, the fund's financial performance. Um, and so when we, that's, that's the context in which we think about these kinds of questions. Now, as a general rule, we don't see divestment as the most appealing and more, most impactful way to manage these risks. In fact, it really just takes us away from the bargaining table, effectively. So if what we prefer is what we call engagement. Engagement is where we collaborate with other large investors. So we, CalPERS, we own about half a percent of any publicly listed company in the United States. But when we, when we combine our money, our ownership interest, with that of other large investors, then we can start a dialogue with boards and executives at these companies that we think might not be doing things the way they should be doing them. And we can influence them that way. And the guns is a very good example. This is an agenda item that's coming up at the board tomorrow. And we've, we've been asked uh, to divest from, from retailers of firearms, large retailers. That includes Walmart, Dick's Sporting Goods, etc. And obviously, gun violence is a very pressing issue in our country. And, um, we, and with the popular movement around divestment from guns, we see that as a relevant business risk for these companies. But what we did was we actually talked to the boards of these companies. And as a result, we've been able to get them to agree to four important things. One is to not sell assault weapons. Two is to not sell high capacity magazines. Three, to not sell bump stocks and other um, accessories that can convert low uh, velocity firearms to high velocity firearms. And four, to change the age at which um, these com at which an individual can purchase guns. So we've been able to work with these companies to get them to change their policies. And in fact, in, in the case of Dick Sporting Goods, they've signed up to an advocacy platform as well. They are going to advocate at the federal level for, for real change in gun laws. So, so, so I can just say, that, now if we had stepped away, if we had said we're not going, we're, we're just going to divest these stocks, we would not have had a voice at the table. They wouldn't have wanted to listen to us and our views around what is relevant business risk for them. So I'll, I'll stop there. And, and could you talk a little bit more about um, like tobacco and some of the other ones? I know that was, you guys were heavily involved and that took more time and I think one thing that I hear a lot, and I've been active in, in trying to get pensions to divest, I'll just tell you that, um, is, you know, you can make a statement today versus the long-term goal. And could you talk about the fiduciary duty and some of the responsibility as a board member that, as an advocate, you know, I might not see when I stand up and say this is the right thing to do. Can you talk a little bit about the, 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 the other responsibilities that you hold as a board member, especially as a president leading the entire body? Sure. So, uh, with respect to tobacco, to, we did, tobacco is one instance where we did divest. And in fact, actually, guns is another one where we did divest from the gun manufacturers that produced weapons that are illegal in the state of California. And that we did uh, about five years ago, I think, a few, few years ago. Um, but, and we, gen as I said, we generally don't see divestment as the right answer. But in the case of tobacco, um, those companies really, um, this is their business. They're not going to diversify significantly away from this. This is the core of their business, and it's on the backs of child labor. It's on the backs of um, ch ch children who smoke. That you know, that you can see the way they're marketing all this vaping technology, right? The, the what, cotton candy flavors and um, all kinds of sugary treats sounding flavors that are certainly meant to attract children, and that's true both in the United States and globally. And so we, we see a real movement around tobacco, and we did a full investment analysis. We brought in external experts to advise us, and we basically based our, our decision around divestment of tobacco not on the evils that we all see of tobacco um, and the, 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 co the healthcare costs for our members, but more on what we saw as the long-term trajectory for this particular industry, where we see rising regulation globally and um, declining market share markets for this for this product. And so we we've seen significant impact on the tobacco industry here in California, but we we think that that's going to have a broad global um, 
uh, that's going to that's going to that's going to have a broad global impact over over the long term. And so that was the basis upon which we made the decision. And as a fiduciary person who has financial a financial duty to all of you of prudence and care and loyalty, um, we have to consider primarily what is the financial impact for all of you of any investment decision that we make. That's not to say that every decision we make is going to be right or wrong. We can all look back in hindsight and say we should have done X, Y, or Z differently, but that we, at the moment we have to really do our due diligence to put all the effort into understanding what the implications are of our decisions for the financial future of the fund. Great. Um, what are some of your priorities moving forward as president? Um, you know, um, there's a, a, the political turmoil, the economic uncertainty, I think, uh, even though the market's doing really well, I think, you know, most people across the country are concerned about their financial and economic stability moving forward. As the leader of a, of, of a 13 person board, what's, what are some of your priorities over the next couple of years? Thank you. Well, first is to make meaningful progress towards um, better funding, a higher funding status for the fund. Uh, we want to we want to get to 100%. We're not going to do that overnight, and we have several key decisions that we're going to have to continue to make um, around how do we achieve that. And I think I think we've done at least for the near term all the things we're going to do that are going to impact the employer. Um, but and and we promise well, one of the things that we've we've said is that we will make sure to give ample notice to both employers and members uh, if, of any decisions that might come up that would impact uh, impact the employer contribution. But I don't expect anything to come up in the near term. Really what we need to focus on now is the investment side. How do we get the investment returns up given our risk profile and our risk tolerance, et cetera. And so that is key on the agenda for this year. And you'll see, the, I think the board's gonna uh, really be considering this um, in various asset class, classes over the next uh, several months. The second thing is that I don't think CalPERS has done a good enough job of putting out our story. You know, we've been, I think, in the past, really on the back foot, defending ourselves, you know, trying to argue our way out of um, the, the, the pension burden questions and all of the, the defined benefit plan uh, attackers. We've been, we've been on the back foot a bit, and we need a much more proactive story that is clearer, more concise, and really resonates with people. So we have a lot of data, we tend to, to use a lot of data, and data can be really useful in, in sort of cutting through lies, but we need, we need a story that's, gonna, that's going to resonate. And part of that, I think, is the work that we're doing around environmental, social, and governance factors, what we were talking about a little bit before. How we are making a positive impact um, on, on companies, on markets, and how that is ultimately going to be for the benefit of our members over the long term, as well as having a positive societal impact. If we can do both of the, all of those things, then that's that's real success. And I think that's something we haven't done a great enough, a good enough job of communicating with our members about. So that's that's high on my agenda as well. That's great. Um, I, you know, one thing that I asked all the candidates as we were going through endorsement processes at the state legislature and uh, and higher was about re uh, retirement security and about this notion that there's a pension crisis out there. Uh, and I think we as labor need to do a better job about communicating that too, the economic benefits that pensions have uh, for people to have retirement stability when they uh, go back to their communities and have the ability to participate in their communities and spend dollars. It's an economic engine pensions, uh, pensions essentially function as. Uh, and we, and I'm glad to hear that, uh, the, that you're gonna take a more proactive role in that too uh, uh, with CalPERS. I don't know, how, how are we doing on time? Because I could just keep going. But, uh, Maybe I can, can I say something sure. about that, if yeah, you don't sure. mind? So um, CalPERS, we recognize that our members are in a fairly fortunate position to have real retirement security. Your average American worker does not. And so a few years ago, we adopted our set of pension beliefs. That's sort of the, the framework that overarches the decisions we make around pension benefits. And on that list is advocacy for retirement security for all Americans. We recognize that our members' secu retirement security cannot persist if, if your average American is, does not have a retire secure retirement. And the statistics now are alarming. Your average 55-year-old has less than $50,000 in savings. How can you retire with $50,000? You cannot. And even let's say that grows to $100,000 by the time you're 70. 
who can, I mean, how many years can you live on $100,000? Not very many years. And certainly not a standard of living, perhaps, that you are used to as a working American. Now, that is a travesty and a crisis here in the United States. And Social Security is only wet one leg of what we call the three-legged stool that every person needs to have in order to have a real secure retirement. One le the f first leg is Social Security. Second leg is pension, is a pension, is a defined benefit pension, preferably. And the third leg is safe savings. You know, people talk about 401ks as retirement vehicles. They're really not retirement vehicles. They're not retirement security vehicles. You, you retire with whatever assets you have. And if, if, God forbid, there was a major market downturn and you lost a significant portion of your 401k, you don't know how long you could, you'll be able to live on the money that you have saved through that vehicle. So it is useful to have a 401k or a 457 or a 403b. Those are all good ways to save money for the future but it's not sufficient to achieve retirement security. Great, can I just uh, ask, how many um, CalPERS participants do we have in the, in the crowd? A lot of you. Yeah. So what would be the best way for us to engage with you? Uh, how, how do we engage uh, more effectively and efficiently on issues around uh, pensions and healthcare? We haven't really talked about on the healthcare component that CalPERS provides uh, to our members, but how do we, work uh, more closely with you moving forward. Yeah, so Brian and Josh uh, and I already talk very frequently about the issues that are facing CalPERS and that um, and that they need to be you know aware of and that I need to be aware of what AFSCME's views are. Um, and that's been a really, I think, fruitful relationship. But I do recognize that sometimes it's hard to get information down to the local level. And there are a couple of things that you can do. One is that you can sign up for alerts around what is coming up on our agenda. So that is something you can get by email and then you can look at it and if there's something of interest to you, you can always participate um, in that agenda item at the CalPERS board. And there's a few ways you can do that. One is that we webcast our board meetings. So if you can't come in person, you're always welcome to come in person and to testify in person at a, at a board, me board meeting. But if you can't come in person, you can still observe what the, how the conversation goes around that particular agenda item. You can send us a letter um, letting us know what your views are and, you, and, um, and that can be either included in the public record or just disseminated to the board members. You can reach out through Josh and, um, and Brian to me and, and happy to, you know, to listen to anything that's, that's on your mind. Um, so those are, those are a few, few different ways, but we, are, we try to be as transparent and open as possible in our decision making. We know that we are, we are do, making these decisions on your behalf and what you think really matters. So um, we welcome your feedback. One thing that I've been talking to Josh and Brian about is how can we you know, get information better disseminated down to sort of the local leadership level and it's a little bit challenging because you, you know, it turns over a bit so any database that we might have of leadership might, um, might age pretty quickly, but we're trying to think about strategies for doing that. So welcome any ideas you all might have about that as well. Great. Well, uh, Sister and President Mother, I thank you so much uh, for your time here today. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having uh, me. It's thanks. been a delight. Thanks, everyone.